अखंडम सच्चिदानंदम अवांग मनसगोचरम आत्मानम अखिलाधारम आश्रये भीष्ट सिद्धये I take refuge in the self the indivisible the existence consciousness bliss absolute beyond the reach of words and thought and the substratum of all for the attainment of my cherished desire so we were on text number 192 which is meditation vedantic meditation so the subject we are discussing are the practices what do you do um we do three things in vedanta the core practices are shravana manana nididhyasana which literally mean hearing reasoning and meditation uh, by shravana we have understood that it is to study the text systematically and the system also we looked at what was the traditional system of interpreting vedantic texts so with the help of a competent teacher you go through the basic vedantic texts and that gives you the uh idea that gives you clarity that the central teaching of all these texts is that you are brahman what is brahman uh, what are we exactly and how are we brahman all these things are clearly mentioned there so we understand the meaning of the text what the teaching of the texts and then the question might be that i have many many questions about all of this many doubts uh and that is clarified in the second step which is reasoning which is uh, mananam we saw last time mananam is mananam to uh, shrutasya advitiya vastuna vedanta anuguna yukti bhihi anavaratam anuchintanam so that which has been understood in the first stage i am brahman this is the teaching this has been understood this has been heard understood and gathered we have got the teaching now now using a variety of arguments reasoning to see this truth intellectually with with clarity so that we are convinced that uh, this has to be the fact we we see that it is so so this clarity comes so once this clarity has come you have completed the second step now you know what it means and you you are completely convinced about it you see it for a fact in fact now what the third stage is meditation what is the purpose of this meditation the purpose is this we have the knowledge now we have the insight now we have actually made a breakthrough about it um we see that we are brahman this is a fact but now comes the problem because of long conditioning um of behaving and thinking and reacting to the world thinking speaking and behaving as if i am this limited body mind not only in this life in many past lives we have been identified with physical bodies we have been identified with the thoughts in the mind and that's how we have lived life this not only this life many lives possibly uh now what happens is even after clarity a peculiar situation can arise where i see that i am unable to put this knowledge to work for me so when problems come up in life and problems will keep coming up in life because of our prarabdha karma each body mind system has its own load of past karma which are giving results in this life a variety of things are happening to us good bad and ugly and our our tendency our conditioning is to respond to it all as a body mind and that causes suffering that's always been so and the strange thing is after the insight also it's not so easy to overcome this conditioning remember you might say why not well, we should be completely free in in an instant yes and no you know you are completely free as the atman that atman which you now see that pure con- existence consciousness place that you see you know that this is a dream but imagine even after knowing that this is a dream if you you had no way of accessing the waking state if you had no way of snapping out of the dream you know it's a dream and yet it continues to be vivid and unbroken it's difficult um, so one one has a tendency in the panchadashi vidyarnya says um two problems and 
um, it is expressed in two ways. What are the two problems? First problem is, I think, I'm conditioned to think I am the body-mind. That's the problem. I react to the world as a body-mind. Yes, I am the Atman, but um, my uh, son does not listen to me. You see the contradiction. At mom one moment I say I am the Atman, and then next moment I'll say, is the prob real problem is with my child. He doesn't listen to me. So you, the, my child, we are already thinking as the Atman now. Mm -hmm. We are already thinking as the body mind, sorry. The moment you say, my uh, uh, child does not listen to me and this is my sorrow, I'm already thinking of myself as the body mind. Again, after getting clarity that I am the Atman, why are we doing that? Uh, it is because of past conditioning. So that's one problem. The second problem is to think of the world as real. What do I mean by real? The, for the enlightened person and for the unenlightened person, the world will keep appearing. The enlightened person knows it to be a dream. Once you have had the breakthrough, after Vedantic study, you have got the breakthrough, that intuitive um, the piercing the veil, let us call it. You, you see that it is, it is a dream. And yet, uh, because of past conditioning, we take it to be real. You know why we take it to be real? The moment we identify with the body, and the mind, the mind and the body, the moment we identify with the ego, to be very precise, the identification comes with the ego. The moment we identify with the ego, ahankara, the ego is part of the mind. And therefore we will identify with whatever is going on in the mind. Sorrow, desire, sadness, all of that we'll identify. It's I who am, because the I is always identified with these things. And the moment you identify with the contents of the mind, you will identify with the body because the mind is intrinsically, very closely connected with the body. So the problems of the body are my problems. The moment we connect with the body, that I am this body, you know what's, going, what's happening? You are transferring your reality. Your reality is the Atman's reality. You're transferring or superimposing it on the body. And the body is superimposed on you, the Atman. Then it becomes real body. The moment you say the body is real, the world will immediately become real because you're identified with a part of the physical universe. The rest of the physical universe also will become real. Husband, wife, children, money, uh, sickness, health, pleasure, pain, um, achievement, failure, everything in the world will now become real. Become real means it will feel real. It doesn't become real actually, but it, you are now nicely trapped in the world illusion. So these are the two aspects of the problem you will face. Then the, um, the two ways in, this, in which this manifests, all I'm quoting from Vidyaranya, in one verse he says in Panchadashi, two ways in which it manifests is, he says, punaf puna kshanat. It says, it comes uh, in an instant. We have no time to deliberate upon it. Somebody throws an insult at you or there's a disappointing news. Something happens in, in the stock market or in the family. It makes you unhappy. People have behaved badly with you. Now in an instant, nobody gives you a menu option. Will you react to it as Turiya or choose your option? Will you react to it as uh, Sarva Priyananda? Then I would have said, I will react to it as Turiya. I will be, I'll know that I am the one reality underlying this dream of the universe. No option is given to me. The mind instantly, Kshanath, he says, uh, Vidyaranya, in an instant, it goes to its default conditioning, not to your, and the mind says, I don't care about your newfangled fancy Vedanta, you know, um, that I am the absolute, all that. No, I will react as I have been trained to over many lifetimes. You say, why? You did it. You trained me to react in this way. You have practiced being worldly. You have practiced being the body. You have practiced being material. Lifetime after lifetime. So this is that it is instant. It manifests this identification with the body and the world is real. This, the second way in which it manifests this problem, he says, puna puna, again and again. If it once in a while I feel I am the body and I react to it, but most of the time I feel I am the witness consciousness, should be fine. But again and again and again, day after day, month after month, uh, all the time in my waking life, in my dream life, I continuously seem to behave like the body. It's only when I sit with Vedanta, Vedanta Sara class and all, I begin to think, no, no, I'm not really the body mind. I am the witness consciousness here. So, 
two problems. I am this body mind. Second, body the world is real. And manifested in two ways, instantly and again and again. So because of this, I am unable to uh, actualize my realization. I am unable to manifest the divinity within me. Now we see the beauty of Swami Vivekananda's definition of religion. He said, um, the, the goal is to manifest the divinity already within us. Not just know it, not just get clarity about it, not just get an intuitive grasp of it, but manifest. Manifest means, again, Swami Vivekananda himself clarifies in another place. My mission in life can be put in a few words. It is to, to you know, preach unto mankind, the preach unto humanity, their inner divinity, and how to make it manifest in every movement of life. That's the crucial phrase. In every movement of life. What is movement of life? In our behavior, in our language, in our thoughts, at least at the level of thoughts, um, the, there's, the shift must be clear. Otherwise, you see, what a strange thing we will be caught in. We have got very clear knowledge, conviction about our inner divinity, about that we are, the, we are existence consciousness place. And we behave in a different way in, in our day-to-day -day life. It's contradictory. So this situation has to be resolved. Technically, this problem is that you have attained knowledge, but this is not Jivan Mukti. The Jivan Mukti, which, which is the goal of Vedanta in, in, uh, for the first, uh, right now we must have, we must reach the stage of Jivan Mukti. Jivan Mukti is the ability to uh, manifest this knowledge, live the truth, you know, walk the talk. After all, um, you might say, why is it necessary? I have now got the knowledge after great difficulty. Now, why further struggle is necessary? You might ask. I understand and I'm convinced. That's it. Well, no, we, we remember where we started the journey. The journey was attainment of bliss and overcoming of suffering. I cannot honestly say that I've overcome suffering. If a pinprick may, makes me say, ouch, if I get upset at the behavior of others, if I, um, you know, I have desires for things of the world because of preconditioning and I keep following those desires. So then it, it's, I have not overcome uh, the conditioning and I have not overcome suffering. So it's a good checklist. It's very, it's practical spirituality. So overcoming suffering, that reminds me, today is a very auspicious day. It is the birthday of Bhagavan Buddha and we offer our salutations to Bhagavan Buddha. It's a thrice blessed day. Vaishak, um, it is the day on which Buddha was born and in the same day at the age of about 35, he attained Bodhi, enlightenment uh, and also Nirvana. And then at the age of around 80, he attained the Mahapari Nirvana, the, the final liberation. You know, very interesting, attaining Bodhi, enlightenment, and then the next more than 40 years he lived and he taught. So in Vedantic terms, that would be called Jivan Mukti you are still in the body, the body goes on in this way, and then what they call Mahapari Nirvana, that means the great liberation, would be called Videha Mukti in Vedantic terms, the physical body falls off. Of course, from the Buddha's perspective, it's already done. Um, by the way, just, just in case anybody is wondering, I'm not saying that the Buddha is to be compared to uh, the usual Jivan Mukta. From our perspective, even from a Hindu perspective, the Buddha is an avatar. Is an, uh, so, an avatar demonstrates the truths of spiritual life. But anyway, his first teaching was there is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there is a release from suffering, and there is a way out of suffering. So unless we have come out of suffering, how can we say we have uh, achieved uh, the goal of uh, Vedanta, and uh, the goal of spiritual life? So this must be actualized. The insight that we have gained, I must be able to live that in day-to-day -day life. It's not even enough to become a monk. You say that these problems are, might be there in the life of a householder. A householder might say that my I'm the Atman, but the real problem is my son is not listening to me. My daughter is misbehaving. And the monk who's the guru might say my disciple is not listening to me. Same problem is there in another form. Um, sometimes bigger. A monk has to establish, maybe establishes an ashram, has to collect funds for the ashram and run the ashram. I remember meeting this sadhu who, whom we studied uh, Ashtavakra from in Gangotri. 
So he used to, he had a little cute little ashram overlooking uh, the, uh, I think Suraj Kund or something. I don't know the exact name of that place. Uh, there, so we would go there and, and listen to his classes. And from there, he could see the, the cave. There were tow towering mountains all around. So he could see the cave where he used to do his sadhana, his spiritual practices in his young age. He had been in the same place for 40, 50 years. And he would point out, see, and he would say, you know, he was old. You'd look at us and you say, you know, I was actually happier there in that cave. I made, I made only one mistake in my life. What is that, Swami? I started this ashram. And we would, of course, say, no, no, we are getting all this benefit because we have started the ashram. He said, I have made only one mistake, starting this ashram. Uh, so even the monk is troubled, troubled by uh, problems. Even if you um, run away from worldly problems, no husband, wife, children to bother about, no possessions to bother about and maintain, no house to you know, pay rent or taxes. Um, you have nothing to do with the world, nothing to do with politics, nothing to do with family problems, relationships, no pro property to maintain. You have a place to stay, uh, maybe a, a, a hut or a, or a cave, and you have food, and you have just enough to wear. So aren't you free of problems, especially if you are interested in spiritual life. If you, if you have strong desires for worldly things, then you'll be uh, in serious trouble if you end up in that situation. But in, if somebody is seriously interested in peace of mind and spiritual life, so aren't you free of problems? Not necessarily. The body is still there. The mind is still there. And uh, that's the source of problems. Suppose illness comes. You have to deal with it. Your prarabdha, prarabdha will come, the, our past karma will catch up with us. Even if we keep changing the scenarios outside, it will manifest in some other way. Some problem it will come. So, uh, problems will keep coming in worldly life. And if I identify myself with the ahankara, whether a monk or a householder, the moment I identify with ahankara, identified with mind, moment I identified with mind, identified with body, what do I mean by identified? Simply, I am this, exactly the way we feel that. I am this. And I react, I live my life as if I am this, the way we are doing all the time. The moment we do that, world, and all the problems and situations generated by my own prarabdha, they will become real. Remember, for the enlightened person also, these will keep appearing. But that's not real for, for that enlightened person. Enlightened person has does not even see himself or herself as a person. See, is a deeper reality compared to which the prarabdha problems are like a dream, are like an illusion or an appearance. And the person, from that perspective, from the higher perspective, paramarthika, the absolute perspective, the Jivan Mukta can deal with the problems much better than we can. So, in fact, this identification with the body, this is what makes Vedanta difficult. Krishna says in the, to answer to Arjuna's question in the 12th chapter, Arjuna asked this question. So we have talked about these two paths, a path of knowledge, which seems very direct, and a path of devotion. Which is better? Who is the greater yogi? And Krishna says, to this has sadness of all us Vedanta Sara student, he says the path of devotion is the better one. Yeah. Why? He says, Avyaktahi gati dukkham dehavad bhiravapyate. He says, the path of the unmanifest, the impersonal reality, that means the, what we are talking about here, that is, much, that is very difficult for the embodied one. Uh, embodied, everybody is embodied. Even the enlightened person is embodied in a certain sense. So what does he mean by embodied? By embodied he means the person who is stuck to this body and mind as my only identity. For that person it's very difficult. So even after the breakthrough, one has to work, uh, has to uh, decondition the mind. This deconditioning of the mind, uh, freeing the mind from past conditioning, the good news is it can be done and can be done pretty fast. You might think, so if lifetimes of conditioning are driving my behavior as body-mind, then what's the point? Even after realizing, will it take lifetimes of meditation to clear up the mess? No, it, it, it can be cleared up pretty fast. And the way it can be cleared up is that understanding which we have got after getting clarity, after Shravana, Manana, it's clear now. That understanding, that conviction, that breakthrough we have got, stay with it. 
stay with it for long hours make that effort and try to live your life according to that that knowledge no i am the witness consciousness not that i am this body and mind um you will see the result will be quite simple the all the virtues that we think of as being associated with saintly life that will be the result you will increase in patience and forbearance you will naturally stick to the truth uh, we will have a sort of natural self control a dispassion for the world an evenness of temper a feeling of uh, unconditional love for everybody a uh, selflessness because we dis- we do not consider this little self to be ourselves so all these things will will manifest that is called the manifestation of the perfection already or divinity already within us that is called jivan mukti and that's a delight at that point one can say i have overcome suffering and i have attained peace and bliss what was promised has been fulfilled so that's the goal how do you do that so that's why this nididhyasan is there this is post breakthrough or even if one says i really don't have that breakthrough yet but do you have an understanding and appreciation for the vedantic truth yes are you convinced about it more or less all right try to stay with it so that trying to stay with it is called nididhyasana um text number 192 so how does that nididhyasana work vedantic meditation 192 विजातीय देहादि प्रत्यरहितात् अद्वितीय वस्तु सजातीय प्रत्यय प्रवाहो निदिध्यासनम् मेडिटेशन इज अ स्ट्रीम ऑफ आइडियाज ऑफ द सेम काइंड एज दोस ऑफ ब्रह्मन द वन विदाउट अ सेकंड टू द एक्सक्लूजन ऑफ सच फॉरेन आइडियाज इज दोस ऑफ द बॉडी एटसेट्रा लेट्स पुट इट वेरी सिंपली दिस वे यू हैव एन यू हैव अ क्लैरिटी आर यू कन्विंस्ड आई एम द दृष्टा नॉट अ दृश्य i am the consciousness not an object if this is this is the clarity you have stay with that feel it staying with that feeling staying with that clarity is what is mentioned here to the exclusion of the opposite i am the body thoughts and feelings come i am the mind no those are contrary tendencies those are dualistic tendencies those are dualistic um vrittis of the mind exclude them that's the effort exclude them stay with i am the witness consciousness i am the witness everything else is an object i am the witness of the five sheets of my body mind i am the witness to which appears the waker and the waker's world the dreamer and the dreamer's world and the deep sleeper and the deep sleeper's darkness that witness i am not as a method of positive affirmation a born of understanding if you do it born of understanding then it is nididhyasana if you do it as a like a i am brahman i am brahman aham brahmasmi i am brahmasmi i am i keep repeating it it's like a mantra not bad but that's not what is meant here and what is meant here is you know the truth stay with it so to the exclusion of the body identification mind identification and uh, the the thoughts which 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 are of the nature i am brahman advitiya vastu sajatiya pratyaya pravaha advitiya vastu the non dual reality what is non dual reality brahman um pratyaya pratyaya means that cognition what cognition aham brahmasmi i am brahman as a truth just like it's like if i repeat now i am sarva priyananda it's a fact for me exactly to that level it must come i am brahman just repeat that fact make it a fact repeat the fact pravaha stream not just i am brahman now back to the world no i am brahman and stay there the stream sajatiya of the same kind i am brahman i am brahman i am brahman it need not be the same words i am the sakshi i am the unattached i am luminosity itself everything else shines and disappears good and bad shines and disappears in my light in me the light and so on this is nididhyasanam vedantic meditation at its highest it will become absorption deep absorption which is called samadhi most praised and valued uh, mental state mental state yeah. 
So Samadhi, the word has been used in many ways. In Mandukya Karika, Gaudapadi uses the word Samadhi to refer to Atma. Satchidananda itself is Samadhi. Here it is the result of this Vedantic meditation. Two kinds of Samadhi. Now, this Samadhi, he will say Savikalpa Nirvikalpa. We have heard these words earlier. In devotional meditation, dualistic meditation, Sarvikalpa Nirvikalpa uh, has a separate meaning. Related but separate meaning. Here it, it, it is a little different. Um, in devotional meditation, what would be Savikalpa Samadhi? I am meditating on Krishna, suppose, or um, Shiva. And I repeat the mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, visualize Shiva. After some time, it will become a very living visualization. And then I will have the actual vision of my chosen deity. I am having the vision of my chosen deity in my heart. It will be a very living, very valuable spiritual experience. That is called Savikalpa Samadhi. Still, there's a difference between I, the meditator, and the process of meditation, and the meditated upon object. Savikalpa Samadhi. It's a, it's a vision. And then the, the difference is obliterated. That is becomes Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Difference between meditation, the meditator, meditation, and meditated upon object. So that is called in the Savikalpa Nirvikalpa in devotional process, dualistic meditation. The same terms are used, but you will see what it means here. It's something quite different uh, in Advaita Vedanta. All right. So what is uh, 193? Samadhi Savikalpa ko Nirvikalpa kascheti. Absorption or Samadhi is of two kinds, namely that attended with self-consciousness and that without it. Um, Self-consciousness, don't get mixed up with pure consciousness and all the self-consciousness means I am the meditator and this is the process I'm following and this is the reality I'm meditating upon. If you have this kind of a framework, it is Savikalpaka. When this framework is erased, it is Nirvikalpaka. Now you'll see what is Savikalpaka Samadhi in Vedanta, in in a Vedantic perspective, Advaitic perspective. 194. Absorption attended with self-consciousness or Savikalpa Samadhi is that in which the mental state taking the form of Brahman, the one without a second, rests on it but without the merging of the distinction of knower, knowledge, and the object of knowledge. That sounds pretty abstract, but it's actually quite simple. It's like watching a movie where you see the different characters and places and events taking place, and at the same time you're aware it's a movie. It's just screen and light. Or waking up from a dream and then thinking about the dream, just, you know, a dream is not a good example. So movie is a good example. Or... You look at the blue sky, and the sky appears blue, and you are aware of the, it's um, aware of the blue. At the same time, your knowledge is that it's not blue. Similarly, it's very clear to me. Here is a body. This is the mind. I am the consciousness in which the mind and the body are appearing, and through this mind and body, in that same consciousness, the world is appearing with all the people and the so-called, uh, um, you know. Um, relationships, problems, all of that is appearing. It's all appearing, but I am very clear. It is appearing in me, the existence consciousness, please. This is Savikalpa Samadhi. And you stay in that that framework as much as possible. It's basically what we have understood from all of this studying till this point. Make it clear in your mind, stay with it and look at the world in that way. This is called Savikalpa Samadhi. It's both possible sitting quietly in meditation, also possible with your eyes open. The world is appearing to you, but you know it is appearing in Brahman. In Brahman, and you are that Brahman. This is Savikalpa Samadhi. Hold on to your questions. I'll just go ahead a little bit. We'll see the Nirvikalpa Samadhi and we'll see the difference. He gives an illustration. What is Savikalpa Samadhi in Advaita Vedanta? 195. Tada Mrinmaya Gajadi Bhanepi Midbhanavat Dvaita Bhanepi Advaita Vastu Advaitam Vastu Bhasate. In that state, the knowledge of the Absolute manifests itself in spite of the consciousness of the relative as 
And to understand all of this, just follow this example. As we know a clay elephant, etc., the knowledge of the clay is also present. So this is a classical example. You see um, sculptures. So Shiva is sitting on the bull or Durga on, on, the, on the lion. It's a stone sculpture. And you can make out the lion and uh, the divine mother Durga and the weapons in her hand and all of that you can make out. But you also know it's stone. You know that the reality is stone. And you are aware of both at the same time. What is the reality? It is stone. And in, as far as name and form are concerned, in the Vyavaharika transactional level, you are able to make those distinctions very clearly. One is Durga, one is uh, the lion, or in this case, uh, it's an elephant, or it may be a man or a horse, but they are all clay images. When you can see both, uh, you are in that Savikalpaka state. This, is, this state he's uh, calling Savikalpaka, and it should be clear. Um, children go to the traditional fairs in India, religious fairs are there, and children go, it's like a festival, and there are toys made of sugar. So, um, there, there's a lion made of sugar and there's a horse and a man and an elephant and the child is uh, crying and I, I want uh, a lion and the mother tells the child, well, all of them are the same thing. You can take a man or an elephant or, uh, or a horse and the child says, like, are you crazy? How can an elephant or a man or a horse be the same thing as a lion? I want a lion. And the mother understands what the child means. Uh, because this is, these are the different forms, fine. And the forms are relatively real because when the child will play a game of um, elephant, horse, man, lion, maybe a hunting game or something like that, then the forms are important and the names are important. But really they are all sugar. So when the mother says they are all the same, the mother is in the Sabikalpaka Samadhi state. Can see both sides. And both are not equal. Sugar is real. Elephant, lion, uh, man, horse, these are all superimposed. Brahman is real. Man, woman, child, um, health, sickness, pleasure, pain in this world panorama, it's all superimposed. When you, this is clear, you can stay with it. Sabikalpaka Samadhi. Eyes closed, eyes open, it does not matter. Then he quotes from, um, so look at the text. In Sabikalpa Samadhi, Tada, then, when? In Sabikalpa Samadhi. Mrinmaya Gajadi Bhane Api. Gajadi, elephant, etc. Bhana means appearance. The elephant appears. But they are Mrinmaya, made of clay. Mridbhanavat. In that appearance of the elephant and the man and lion, what appears? Clay. To whom does it appear? The one who understands it's made of clay. Child might say, it's an elephant. Mother would say, yeah, it's an elephant. It's also clay. Or it is actually clay. How is it clay? It's an elephant. This is a lion. This is a tiger. It's a human being. Yes, but literally they are nothing other than clay. Advaita bhane api advaita vastu bhasate. Even when the entire dualistic universe, dvaita bhanam, dvaita dualistic, bhanam appearance. An entire dualistic universe appears. What is so this dualistic universe? Where do you get one? Here, we are right now in it. This is appearing. All of this is exactly appearing. The enlightened one sees exactly the way we see. Even in that, in and through that, what shines forth? Not clay. <laughs> uh, the, it, uh, Brahman shines forth. Advaita Vastum, the non-dual reality shines forth. So this is a good example. Then... This Upanishadic, in all the golden ornaments, necklace and bracelet and the tiara and the ring, gold shines forth. In all the pottery and pottery barn, uh, it's the clay which shines forth. Uh, in all the iron implements, it's the iron which shines forth. In all the waves, uh, it is water which is uh, appearing. So in that way, it's Brahman which is the truth, which is evident, self-evident all the time, effortlessly to this person. I won't say effortlessly. In the Savikalpa Samadhi, he's making an effort to stay with it. Um, then he quotes from 
Shankaracharya. This is from Upadesha Sahasri. It's one of Shankaracharya's major uh, prakaranas, introductory texts on Vedanta. It's introductory, but it's also pretty advanced. Taduktam drisheswarupam gaganopam amparam sakridvibhatam tvajamekam aksharam alepakam sarvagatam yadadvayam tadevachaham satatam vimuktam om Iti Upadesha Sahasri. Thus it has been said, I am that Brahman, that intelligence absolute, formless like ether, supreme, eternally luminous, birthless, the one without a second, immutable, unattached, all-pervading, ever free. Drishi Swarupam. So well, what do you do with this kind of a verse? He's just giving it as an example, a quote from the master, Shankaracharya. The person who is in Savikalpaka Samadhi, or each of these words would be true. Like if I were try to try Savikalpaka Samadhi on my present stage at Sarva Priyananda, I am Sarva Priyananda. And I can see it for a fact. Yes, it is true. And I am sitting in my chair. Yes, it is true. Uh, I am wearing uh, the ochre robe. Mm, yes, it is true. Check, check, check. And you check, it's true. In Savikalpaka Samadhi, such a verse, the enlightened person would be able to check, go through the checklist and say, yes, it's a fact. Not something that I'm trying to believe, not something that I'm trying to program my mind, brainwash my mind into that or positive state of thing, or repeating uh, like a mantra. No. You see it for a fact, simple fact. If you stay with it, it's, it is called Savikalpaka Samadhi. So what does this person see, the enlightened one? Drishi Swarupam. I am always the witness consciousness. Is it true? Check. Yes. Effortlessly. I don't have to try. I am always that. Gaganopam amparam, transcendent, transcendent like what? Like the sky. You see, everything, the entire physical Manhattan, everything is in the sky. Uh, um, the clean air and the polluted air uh, and the good things and bad things. The sky is completely unattached. It gives space for all of this. The sky makes all of this is spacious enough to accommodate the universe. Everything can be there. Everything can play around in the sky. And nothing, the sky or space, is not affected by anything. Similarly, I am that witness consciousness, existence consciousness, please, in which the universe of the good and the bad, of the human and the non-human, of the body and the mind, of gross and the subtle, all of these appear because I give space to it. It is in me that the, all these things appear. The movie screen might say, I am giving the foundation, the space, for all sorts of movies. It could be science fiction movies, tragedies and comedies and uh, actors and animals and so many things can appear and play around. I give space to all of it and I am totally unaffected by any of it. Check. Yes, it is true. See, what a, what a tremendous freedom this is. It's, it's thrilling. It could be scary at first. Uh, but it's, it's also incredible. It makes you limitless. There's not one thing which offers resistance to you. It's all in you. It, it shines in you. I mean, they're not in you like things are in your pocket. They are in you like things are in your dream. They are in you like uh, the blue color in the, uh, in the sky. They are in you like um, a snake in the rope, in that sense, in you. Sakrit vibhatam tvajam ekam aksharam, shining forth. Uh, ajam, the unborn. I am the unborn. I am the one. There is no possibility of any second. Aksharam, I am the unchanging, and so on. So all of this is, you have a checklist here. And it need not be only this verse. Vedanta is full of such verses. In the Upanishads and the later Vedantic masters, they've composed it. They just look at their experience, and if they happen to know Sanskrit, they come up with nice Sanskrit poetry to describe their experience in some way, and we can check. Then, staying with it, something happens. Happens where? happens in the mind, not in the Atman. The mind moves from this kind of awareness to becoming absorbed. See, here, I am still, I am the one who is experiencing myself in this way. This is still there. That will also disappear into a state where the mind is not functioning anymore. It is the, the distinction between the knower, the known and knowledge is erased. The mind is still there but like an unflickering flame in a windless place. 
That is called Nirvikalpaka Samadhi. 197. Nirvikalpakas tu gyatri gyanadi vikalpalaya pekshaya advitiya advitiya vastuni tadakara karitaya shitta vritte atitaram eki bhave navasthanam. Absorption without self consciousness. Nirvikalpaka Samadhi is the total emergence in Brahman, the one without a second of that mental state which has assumed its form, the distinction of knower, knowledge and object of knowledge being in this case obliterated. This is also called Asampragyata Samadhi. This is the corresponding, this is the Samadhi corresponding to the yogic Asampragyata Samadhi. And this is a powerful state. Um, you know, if one can attain this, um, that problem of previous conditioning is overcome easily. You, it's wiped out that previous conditioning. Your knowledge of the Atman is, is the same. It is, it is already, you already know that you are Chidananda Rupa Shivoham. But now what will happen is coming back from such states, it's easy to live it. It's easy to say that I am not the body and mind. It's absolutely clear. So I don't react as body and mind to the problems. When the world appears, body appears, mind appears, I don't react to the problems generated by the prarabdha of the person. I'm not the person anymore. That, that's, that explains the extraordinary uh, capability of enlightened beings to withstand sorrow and pain, physical level, emotional level, deprivation, what might seem terrible to others, to us, but from their perspective, it's nothing. It's like a, not even a flea bite. Swami Vivekananda gave the example of a big bull or an ox on whose horns a mosquito came and sat. After some time, the mosquito felt a little uneasy and said, oh, Mr. Bull, um, I'm sorry, I sat on your horn without asking you your permission. I hope you are not, uh, I did not cause any discomfort. And the bull said, oh, you're there. I didn't even notice. Oh, you're welcome. You come with your entire family, your brood and settle down there. It's nothing to me. So that will be our attitude to samsara. Um, we'll be able to manifest that reality, that, that our knowledge in day-to-day -day life. So Gyatri, Jnana, Vikalpa, Laya. The difference between the knower, the knowledge, and uh, the, pro, the thing which we are realizing, the non-dual reality. Those distinctions are erased. Those distinctions are actually not there. They are created by the mind. So when the mind uh, is stilled in Nirvikalpa Samadhi, the distinctions also disappear. And yet, you are left with um, the absolute reality, which you cannot at that point express as the absolute reality. You already know it. Now the question here might be, this is exactly what the yogi is trying to do. The Patanjali yogi. Uh, instead of going through all this Vedantic study, why not just still the mind? It won't work. What will happen is, Sri Ramakrishna calls it Jara Samadhi. If you really are able to still the mind like that, what will happen is, Either you come out of it and you reflect back upon your experience and you become enlightened at that moment. That can happen. Or you enter into a tremendous, peaceful, thoughtless state. Stay for some time, come out of it, and you're back to where you were. Not exactly where you were because you are already an accomplished meditator. Probably you are much calmer and more peaceful than others, but not enlightened. Uh, so that can happen. The... The nirvikalpaka or asampragyata state for a person who has deeply studied and immersed himself or herself in Vedantic knowledge is an extraordinarily powerful way of overcoming past conditions, becoming a jivan mukta, um, manifesting the divinity within, as Swami Vivekananda says. For a person who has not made the breakthrough, it can be helpful in making the breakthrough or it can just be a very deep and nice meditative state. That's it. So when um, the distinctions have been erased, then what happens? 198, text number 198. Tadatu jalakara karita lavana anavabhasena jalamatra vabhasavad advviti avastuakara karita chitta vritti just as 
when the salt has been dissolved in the water it is no longer perceived separately and the water alone remains similarly the mental state that has assumed the form of brahman the one without a second is no longer perceived only the self remains so ramakrishna gave this example the salt doll which went to measure the ocean so from outside it can talk about the ocean here is the ocean and it's like the savikalpaka state here is brahman you know you can talk about it as we did till now but the moment it enters walks into the ocean what happens to it it dissolves in the ocean now who's going to say what the ocean is like is become one with the ocean it is the ocean now it's become infinite it's not a little congealed salt doll does it mean i am gone no you are now the infinite which you always were it's like the ocean had forgotten itself had generated a little salt doll which was walking around and creating all this mess now the salt doll has been persuaded to come back and touch the ocean the moment it touches the ocean it it you know melts back into the ocean so it's a good uh, way of putting it at that state in nirvikalpaka samadhi or sampragyata samadhi the salt doll is not there anymore it is there as the ocean so um let me just take a few questions and come to the next issue of samadhi and sleep deep sleep there are some comments here um rita says oh seeking blessings on auspicious buddha jayanti purnima yes we all pray to the bhagavan buddha um for blessings rita again asks how is this similar different from japa meditation um as i said in the beginning the two kinds of meditation the dualistic devotional meditation where you have japa and the ishta devata and you repeat that and the it will culminate in savikalpaka samadhi in the vision of your ishta devata it will be a living vision and it will become available at other times i have told you about the story of swami gambhirananda ji the 11th president of our order who was asked that have you seen god and he said what do you mean by seeing god every time i close my eyes i see blazing forth in my heart the living form of my chosen deity my ishta devata effortlessly so that somebody who's already established in uh, savikalpaka samadhi and quite possibly nirvikalpaka samadhi but that's the devotional approach the japa and dhyana will lead there if you see um swami saradananda ji's description of this process in the great master he shows how after that it leads to the uh, non dual realization also that also is possible through this method of japa and dhyana then suman asks drashta and rishya are both are one consciousness there are no two only oneness is it is it not so in the first stage this you must be able to uh, answer now drashta and rishya means seer and seen um in the first stage one must distinguish the real seer the witness consciousness from everything else so everything becomes an object you alone of the consciousness see these are not theories you must you must track it in your experience when you say drashta and rishya are one consciousness are you speaking from some kind of um, you know you read read it in a book or you feel it must be so or are you speaking from your experience what is our experience i am the seer the book is the scene i am the seer and the book is the scene here i am the drashta this is drishya where do i find consciousness in my own experience i find it within myself in the drashta not in this book is this uh, understood this it is actually i am reporting a simple fact the simplest fact don't argue here no but uh, vedanta says this book is also consciousness what anybody says does not matter what do you feel right now ultimately it must be clear to you it is clear that i am the awareness and i am aware of a book the book is an object i am the subject the book is the scene i am the seer this is this is the how we talk and how we experience life start there then you go you know then second stage the eyes themselves are the scene and the mind is the seer where do you find consciousness in the mind not in the eyes i am conscious where i am the conscious mind experiencing the eyes is it not so each stage uh, we should take it very slowly then go further track in your experience 
I am the consciousness of the thoughts and feelings in the mind. Where is the consciousness? In me, the one who feels um, A, B, C, D, or thinks a thought, A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. This is a thought. Which is conscious? I, the one who thought that thought, or is the A, B, C, D conscious? Not at all. A, B, C, D is just like a mental language, you know, repeating a word mentally, repeating something mentally. It's, I am aware of it. One, two, three, four is not conscious. A, B, C, D is not conscious. Conscious means, is it conscious of me or am I conscious of it? I am conscious of it. So in this way, you isolate the drashta. Isolate means, I am the drashta, only the drashta, without the drishya. I am the atma, without the anatma. Without means, I have separated myself in my understanding. Now, I am the awareness in which this world appears. This is called Sankhya. Then comes Advaita. And there's a whole process where we see that then all of this which we saw separate from ourselves, see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, reflect, all of this, is it an independent reality apart from me, the consciousness, or is it an appearance in me, the consciousness? Is there any possibility at all, even in principle, of there being experienced without consciousness? Experience means consciousness. So they are all dependent upon consciousness. They cannot be anything other than consciousness. They are names and forms imposed upon consciousness. The otherness is a projection. In that sense, now if you say Suman, if you say Drashta and Drishya, both are one consciousness. Yes, in that ultimate sense, true. Then only Advaita is established. But one must be careful about this process. So otherwise there's a um, possibility of a mistake. Rick says, do recluses have an advantage over householders in performing Nididhyasanam? Yes, I must admit that. Recluses have nothing more to do. All you have to do all day long, you're supposed to do is, you gather your bhiksha, your uh, food, and that also is nowadays in many places available in one place. You don't have to go from house to house. You get it. Um, you don't have to cook, you don't even have to wash the dishes, you eat and you come back. <laughs> I remember a particularly funny, uh, cute episode in one little ashram in the Himalayas where monks were being fed and I used to go and have food there also. So one monk decided to introduce an innovation. Uh, now you will consider it a horrible innovation, plastic spoons. So. <laughs> Earlier we used to eat with our hands from leaves and the leaves would be thrown into the river. It's organic, it will decompose immediately within a short time. So they told us, be careful. Um, the leaves have to be thrown and don't throw the spoons. The spoons have to be washed and then returned to be used again. And we are all the monks are used to you know, finish food, uh, victory to the Lord, toss it into the river. And all the leaves and the plastic spoons went into the river. So the innovation lasted only for one day. They decided to go back to the old system. But there are ashrams in which there are these metal plates and utensils. Anyway, my point is, it's taken care of for you in most cases. You have a place to stay. You don't even have to pay rent. It's a cave or... Even there, there are funny incidents. There was... A... The government was making records of the land in Gangotri at that time. So this uh, up and doing young bureaucrat and his assistant with a laptop came and was going around taking records uh, from monks. One monk came to me sorely worried. He said, look, you are an educated young man. Can you tell me what do I do? They have come to me and ask, they're asking me for papers for my cave. Where do I get papers for the cave? It's just that the Swami who lived there earlier had died and I went and uh, started staying there and I've been staying there for 20 years. Where do I get for the papers for the cave? Uh, so but anyway, the point is that you don't have to show, have papers for the cave. You don't have to pay rent. All this is taken care of for you. All you have to do is Shravana Manana Niridhyasana. Stay with the study, stay with the reflection, stay with the Niridhyasana. So it is easier for recluses. Now, one advantage of, uh, of the Vedantic approach is this eyes open meditation. One, if one consciously tries to do that, one can do that in uh, worldly, in householder life also. One can do that. It's not impossible. 
In fact, if one develops the capacity of doing that in the midst of uh, activities in the world, it is a more powerful meditation. The things are happening all around you, in your mind, outside, and yet you can stay centered. Then nothing can shake you. Is there a danger that trying to stay with the understanding that I am Brahman while performing worldly activities might divide the mind and thus make one less effective in activity? No. When, when an activity uh, takes up your attention, do it. Don't do that in the middle of heavy traffic. You're going to crash and cause a mess. But in many cases, you can, um, or in the midst of activity, you can stop it and quietly withdraw and center yourself and come back into the activity again. Shweta Singh says, wouldn't it be Sahaja Samadhi? Ultimately, yes. Once, you see, this is Nididhyasana. Nididhyasana is a practice. It's meant for solving a problem, for removing a particular type of obstacle, a big obstacle, which is everybody complains. After you are sufficiently advanced in Advaita Vedanta, you, you will all have the same complaint. That how can I live this? It goes away, Swami. It is swept away. Or how can I live it from day to day? How can I get the benefits of it, the peace of mind, the strength, uh, the, the stability? There, this problem is solved by Nidhityasana. Once the problem is solved, then what are you? One name for that is called Sahaja Samadhi. A Jivan Mukta is always in Sahaja Samadhi. Whether with eyes closed, you still may meditate or eyes open. Um, there, there's a stage before that. When you are practicing Nirvikalpa, this, um, I will say Nididhyasana, when you are practicing Nididhyasana, you might feel disturbed with your interactions with the world and to, to take care of that disturbance, that loss of balance, you practice Nididhyasana. The monks, there, they know this is an ancient problem. So they have the nice stories. So they tell the story of the mongoose. The mongoose always fights with the cobra. So, and actually you can see this. Oh, I have seen it a couple of times. So there is, I don't know if it is true or not, but it seems to be a story or a myth that the mongoose sometimes gets bitten by the cobra. They are extraordinarily skilled little animals, but they, sometimes it does get bitten. The cobra is very fast. So it does get bitten by the cobra and the poison spreads in its body, but the mongoose knows what's to, what to do. So it rushes off into the, uh, the bushes in the jungle and it knows there is a particular kind of herb if it chews on that herb, the poison goes down. Now, I don't know if it's actually that way. Maybe it is. They have observed it. But maybe it's just a story to illustrate that. So, when you are this advanced um, Vedantic student, dealing with the world, Maya will inject its poison in, in you. You may get upset. You may get annoyed. You may lose your balance temporarily. Go back and chew the, the herb of Vedanta. Stay with that for some time. The poison of Maya will go away from your system. Then you can go back and fight with the cobra again of samsara. <laughs> That's the story. Um, Prabir Basu says, does it mean that one will be in Savikalpak Samadhi while engaged in the world? Yes, this will be quite different from the yogic Samadhi. You're right. One can sit quietly and be absorbed in Savikalpak Samadhi um, or with eyes open, Brahmat Panam Brahmavi. Uh, you know, that fourth chapter of the Gita where you see Brahman in the midst of all actions, Brahma Karma Samadhi, who sees in the midst of actions Brahman. Now, that is not possible in yogic, in Patanjali Yoga Samadhi. Patanjali Yoga Samadhi, Savikalpaka or Sampragyata and Sampragyata Samadhi, you must be still, you must be seated, you must cut away the world. You can't be in, in the middle of action and yet say, I am in Samadhi. And that is at least not allowed by Patanjali. But in this Vedantic approach, you can be both ways. After all, it is Brahman. <laughs> I mean, with eyes open, also it is Brahman. What else is it? When the movie is on and the movie is switched on, uh, switched off, when the movie is switched on and the movie is switched off, in both cases, it's just the screen. There's nothing else there. Um... Poonam ji says, Poonam Tandan says, for Samadhi, Abhyas and Vairagya, Abhyas and Vairagya both are necessary. Does Vairagya, how does Vairagya help? If Vairagya, Vairagya is dispassion. So for this practice, Krishna says in the sixth chapter, 
अभ्यासेन तो कौन थे या वैराग्य न चक्री है थे रेगुलर प्रैक्टिस इज नेसेसरी यू आर डी कंडीशनिंग द माइंड सो रेगुलर प्रैक्टिस इज नेसेसरी इट्स नॉट जस्ट रीडिंग अबाउट इट रेगुलर प्रैक्टिस इज नेसेसरी एंड वैराग्य वैराग्य इज डिस्पैशन फॉर द वर्ल्ड इफ यू डू नॉट हैव डिस्पैशन फॉर द वर्ल्ड माइंड विल नॉट बी स्टडी इफ देर थिंग्स इन द वर्ल्ड विच अट्रैक्ट अस विच टेम्प्ट अस और टेरिफाई अस so in both cases the mind will be agitated it will be very difficult to settle the mind down this there's a story of the three friends who were drunkards who one day they were drunk they were decided to go home they went to the boat they had to cross a river and they started rowing the boat in the morning they found they were sitting right there they had not moved an inch from the bank because they had forgotten to untie the rope so that is vairagya unless you untie the rope from samsara you will be stuck there we may sit in meditation think about read about vedanta and try to concentrate so externally you have cut yourself off from the world but internally if thoughts keep coming uh, that means vairagya is less why will things up which do not interest us thoughts about them don't come in our mind if we have dispassion for them if we are disinterested in them if you have renunciation for that then those thoughts will not come up in the mind it will be much easier to meditate you're making a life more difficult if you have if you maintain secretly maintain a little bit of you know my favorite little attachments and then meditate those things will trouble us patrick says did i understand that correctly raj yogi that experiences every kalpa samadhi might not change in this life much and will not be released no um, uh, raj yogi in the sense of patanjali yoga Uh, if if that uh, realization does not come now a person who's properly practicing patanjali yoga uh, uh, at least a sankhyan or yogic realization will come that i am the purusha and the world uh, is the prakriti the prakriti purusha the yoga that means a separation of consciousness and matter that much realization will come if a person systematically practices what i was saying is there is the distinction between making the mind thoughtless and just that and immersing yourself in the advaitic understanding there is a distinction between the two what we are talking about here is immersing yourself in the advaitic understanding to the exclusion of all other thoughts um and also sri ramakrishna has given the example what he called jado samadhi so a person was showing some magic tricks or something you know and was saying abracadabra and because of certain practices his mind went into a um, still absolutely still state it became quiet and sat there like a statue for a long time for a long time like a stone statue the moment his awareness came back to the world and the body the first thing he said was abracadabra so <laughs> whatever samskaras were there earlier that continued So that means uh, it did not that just being thoughtless for a long time does not make one enlightened dimitri says what will be the logic to prove that existence is not separate from consciousness without involving experience okay this is a subtle question existence is not separate from consciousness now this is an interesting question because normally the way we are experiencing the world it may seem that there is my existence as a conscious being is consciousness and existence seems to go together but there are a lot of existences around me which are not conscious they are objects to my consciousness book it exists book is existence but it's not conscious i am conscious of it so existence can be there without consciousness and this is what we feel there's a world out there which i am not conscious of so it exists Uh, and it's not in my consciousness also in no sense is it in uh, conscious now uh, it's difficult to understand this this question how can we understand that exp- the existence and consciousness are the same thing without talking about experience we're making my job harder by leaving experience out of it then just think about the dream uh, experience in dreams 
even without talking about experience the moment you wake wake up and think about dreams there were things which you were aware of as the person in the dream you were aware of yourself and something in your neighborhood and you were also vaguely aware that there is a world out there in your dreams nobody thinks in the dream that i am dreaming and i am in the in the head of one person we think we are in the world so part of the world we are experiencing just as we are experiencing now we see hear smell taste certain things some simulation of that is in the dream and importantly there is a vague awareness of the world other than what i am experiencing in the dream just as there is now when we wake up what do we say oh whatever i was experiencing was within my experience and therefore in the mind of the dreamer but also the vaguely sensed world around the dreamer that was also part of the mind of the dreamer there was no world out there in the dream it was just uh, the whole thing the exp- known and the unknown the experienced and the not experienced all of it was part of the dream is that uh, or you can think of a movie in the movie um the character the hero may be talking with some people may be sitting in a cafe and sipping coffee on a sidewalk in manhattan and in the movie there is a larger world manhattan is there the united states the world and the universe are there in the movie it's there and only a part of that is being experienced by the hero what is the hero of the movie experiencing that particular sidewalk uh, a cafe in manhattan and there is a larger world which nobody in the movie is experiencing but it's part of the plot of the movie obviously there must be a universe and yet we know all of it is an appearance in the scene of the part which the hero was seeing experiencing and that which he was not experiencing the experienced world of the hero and in inex- not experienced world of the hero both are appearances in a movie in the simulation i'll let her leave it at that um there is a more subtle okay um, i'll just give you a hint so this is to answering dimitri's question the more subtle and direct way of answering this question existence and consciousness are the same thing ask yourself what exactly do you mean by existence uh, in our lived life it is always something exists in our experience in our consciousness that existence in fact if you pursue it closely that sense of existence is never separated from my sense of being a, a conscious being conscious being consciousness being is existence isness awareness actually are the same thing we are just using two words it is a it's a shining uh reality or one word would be good it's a presence 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 has connotation of both consciousness and existence right uh, shweta says is it not easier to spot the screen when the movie is not playing exactly that's why yogic samadhi is uh, preferred by many to be absorbed in brahman is it not ne- is it not necessary to unclutch from the worldly uh, projection isn't there more concentration when you're sitting in meditation absolutely all of these are true that's why many people prefer the yogic approach patanjali yoga approach switch off the movie appreciate the screen for what it is and then you come back when the movie is on you understand this what is the screen and what is the movie that's patanjali yoga the classic patanjali yoga patanjali yoga is that um, swami vivekananda says yoga chitta vritti nirodha when your mind is absorbed in samadhi no vrittis are there movie switched off then what happens tada drashtu swarupi avasthanam then the witness is seen in its real nature the screen is appreciated for what it is minus movie when the movie is on what is the problem the problem in the next sutra it says um vritti sarupyam itaratra as long as the movie is playing the screen is hidden covered up and mixed up with the movie similarly the witness consciousness is mixed up with thoughts feelings emotions reactions body world all of that it's very difficult to distinguish consciousness in uh, when mind is active that's why mind is settled down in samadhi that's the point then what's the point of advaitic uh, the advaitic approach why is the advaitic approach called a direct approach 
Advaitic approach is called the direct approach because Advaitic, Advaitic approach is literally the truth. Isn't it true that uh, even when the movie is playing, it is the screen. Whether you can appreciate it clearly or not, that's a secondary thing. That's our problem. The problem of the mind, of the practitioner. It's a practical problem. But what is the truth? The truth is that the witness consciousness is always there, regardless of whether the movie is playing or not. And if you, if you stay with that, it's the, it's the most straightforward way to appreciate the truth. And anyway, even through um, yogic meditation, you will ultimately end up with this. In yogic meditation also, you attain asampragnata samadhi. The point is not that you have to always stay in asampragnata samadhi. That would be um, like a perpetual, you have to stay in samadhi, otherwise you're trapped again. No, you get the insight and then in samadhi and out of samadhi also the same insight stays. Then only you are liberated. If it is available only in samadhi, one Swami put it very nicely. Lo apne pyare ko samadhi ki jail mein band kar diya. If it is available only in Samadhi, see, you have, you have put your beloved in the jail of Samadhi. <laughs> it's available only in Samadhi and not outside. But that should not be the uh, case. Advaita Vedanta says it's always effortlessly available. Ulka says, from the readings of the life of Holy Mother, do you think we can say that Ma used to be in the state of Savikalpa Samadhi towards the later half of our life? Ma used to have samadhi, both savikalpaka and nirvikalpaka, as far as we understand, quite effortlessly throughout her life. Um, Rick says, the silence of the mind experienced in Patanjali-style meditation gets integrated and stabilized. So the mind becomes quite silent in activity. Agreed. Shweta says, you can never say you exist without being conscious of it. That is true. Rekha says, could idealism be what Dimitri is talking about? In idealism, existence and consciousness are identified. It is, it is uh, mind first, then only things exist. But there's a difference between Advaita and idealism, at least the Berkeleyan kind of idealism. There's a big difference, uh, which is why Shankaracharya strongly criticizes Buddhist Vijnanavada, uh, extensive criticism of Buddhist Vijnanavada. Buddhist Vijnanavada is subjective idealism. Uh, pretty similar to Berkeleyan idealism, subjective idealism. And that is not Advaita Vedanta. There, is, there are differences. Gaurapada also makes it very clear in his uh, uh, Alata Shanti Prakaran and Mandukya Karika. i just leave it at that. Alpana says, if existence was outside of consciousness, then something needs to be conscious of that. And also other way around, non non-existent cannot be conscious. Correct. Dimitri says the paradise is clear when experience is paradigm, I, I guess you mean, when experience is the proof. Absent experience, it is hard to logically prove it. I'll just say one thing here. Think about experience itself. You know, one of the definitions of um, Brahman is it is experience. Anubhava matram param Brahma. Experience itself. Whether objects of experience are present or not. When objects of experience are present, we call it an experience. Supposing without objects of experience, what happens? The experiencing consciousness remains like light without anything to reflect off. So experience itself, without experience, you say, in an absolute sense, is it even possible? You have to demonstrate. Also, uh, then he says, However, from the personal first person, there is no contradiction as experience is always there. Therefore, uh, the same existence and consciousness would be the same. Same with existence and consciousness. Yes. A first person view, it is true. But um, think about it. Is there anything other than the first person view? <laughs> we think of the first person view as one alternative is the first person view. Then there's the objective view, the scientific view, the you know, the God's eye view and different, but all of them are within the first person. So the first person alone who's talking about all of this, there's nothing else other than the first person. That's a very radical kind of uh, um, solip solipsistic Advaita. All right, a lot of high talk here. Let's stop at this moment. Om.
ಶಾಂತಿಶಾಂತಿಶಾಂತಿ ಹರಿ ತತ್ಸತ್ಕೃಷ್ಣಾರುಪಣಮಸ್ತು ದ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಕಲ್ ಅಪ್ಶಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ನಾಟ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕಿಂಗ್ ಔಟ್ ಆರ್ ನೆವರ್ ವಾಸ್ ಐ ನಾರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅದ್ವೈತ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ಪೀಕಿಂಗ್ ಔಟ್ ಅಗೇನ್ಸ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಷನ್ ಆಲ್ವೇಸ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಷನ್ ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಗ